So um, check out that training for those training opportunities. There's also a couple uh, training opportunities uh, in the wilderness and wild and scenic river. Um, thing. Pete, do you want to say anything about that real quick? Uh, yeah, sure, Lynn. You got me uh, off mute. Yes. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, a bunch of folks are collaborating to put on uh, the National Wilderness Skills Institute, May 24th to 26th, virtual institute with a bunch of sessions that involve wilderness, wild scenic rivers, and Forest Service trails. And I'll drop uh, some information in the chat about that. Thanks, Lynn. Sure. I'm putting the cohort uh, Google Drive in the chat. It's also it's uh, tinyurl.com backslash new read cohort. Um, that'll get you there. Um, I'm really uh, glad we're doing this um, panel today. I'm honored to have worked with I think, every single one of these people on this panel and uh, I'm going to have to leave halfway through. I just want to say fire season has started. Um, the Southwest is alive and well with four one teams going to be there in the next two days. So be safe out there, everybody, and have a great fire season. Enjoy the day. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so good morning, everyone. Today we have uh, a panel with the topic of tribal liaison and their role in a fire. So we have three panelists present. Uh, just checking, is Trina Cunningham on by chance? She was also invited. Maybe there's a technical problem there. Yes, Tom, I'm here. I'm okay, on the road, great. so I had a great. little connectivity. Sure, thank you for joining us. So uh, then we have four panelists and um, I would ask them to introduce themselves briefly. And um, let's start with Dirk Charlie. Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's an honor to, to present and share information. I'm a, I'm a retired U.S. Forest Service employee from the Sierra and Sequoia National Forest. I'm a tribal um, liaison for the Dunlap Band of Mono Indians, and I'm also a call when needed tribal liaison for the Sierra Sequoia National Forest. And uh, my background is in fire management, ex hotshot foreman, but also in human resources and civil rights, public affairs. Um, and I hope that information that I want to share here uh, helps you in your role and responsibility as uh, effective uh, resource advisors. Thank you. Thanks, Dirk. Um, how about Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, everybody. You got me, Tom? Yeah, I can uh, hear you fine. I'm really, same with Dirk, really happy to be here today. Uh, this is quite the honor, and I'm really excited to present on some of these topics. Um, my name is Sarah Hoagland. I'm a Pueblo of Laguna tribal member. Um, my day job is working in the Rocky Mountain Research Station at the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab. Um, I guess I'm the, the only native woman that works for the Forest Service within R&D uh, with a PhD. Um, and so I'm right now actually serving as a detailer in the Washington office as the national program lead for tribal research. Um, so um, just flew down from Missoula, Montana yesterday from the fire lab and I'm down here in New Mexico, not on a fire, but starting um, second stint of field work. But, yeah, I think the topic today um, has a lot of relevance and um, just really looking forward to sharing some of the conversations. So thanks again for the invite. Thank you, Sarah. How about uh, Yolinda? Please introduce yourself. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Yolinda Begay. I'm the district ranger on the Mount Taylor Ranger District over in uh, New Mexico. I'm based out of Grants, New Mexico, kind of central part of the state here. Um, it is an honor to be here as well to um, present alongside Sarah, Dirk, as well as Trina. Um, looking forward to hearing the rest of your presentation, Dirk, Sarah, and Trina. Thank you for having me. 
Okay, and Trina Cunningham. Uh, good morning, Sasakati. Um, good to see my friends that I haven't seen since the Dixie fire. Um, So I also appreciate being invited to this panel and I really appreciate the elevation of the need of, of a tribal liaison during a fire. Um, my name is Trina Cunningham. I am currently the executive director of the Maidu Summit Consortium, which is a, 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 a consortium of eight different tribes and tribal organizations within our homeland. And I've been working on fire and water issues um, as both a private contractor, um, for the past 20 years, I'm on, on my way to a Water Solutions Network statewide water meeting, and that I've really stressed it, the importance of, of having healthy fire and healthy water and the need for more investment in our ecosystems um, to keep large wildfires like this from happening. But um, the role of the tr tribal liaison um, as a practitioner and somebody who's very engaged in those processes um, is so important and I'm looking forward to further discussion around it. I also, um, I am on the Plumas County Fire Safe Council board and um, uh, the Upper Feather River IRWM, which is Integrated Regional Water Management Plan. So really large scale planning um, around water and fire issues in my region. Thank you, Trina. So uh, the format today is we have three questions. Uh, we want time for each panelist to be able to respond so that the total time for each question is going to be about 15 minutes. During that time, uh, a panelist can uh, provide a presentation with a PowerPoint or however you like. Uh, that's totally optional, but uh, we want to give each person time to speak extensively on the topic. Um, I'll facilitate, try to keep us uh, at about 15 minutes for each question. So uh, the first question is, um, in your view, what is the most effective way for a tribal liaison to work on a wildfire incident? And uh, maybe let's start with uh, Sarah on that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. So yeah, this first question, I, so I didn't prepare a PowerPoint. I just have sort of my talking points here, but I that's uh, fine. Hopefully that'll be okay. Yeah. So how can we be effective as tribal liaisons working on a fire? I came up with three main points. Um, the first one being increasing the representation of native voices, their concerns and their issues. Um, so I really saw that as sort of my duty and um, I followed uh, Yolinda on the Dixie fire, and I felt like that truly was one of my primary responsibilities um, is just making sure that tribal voices are being heard. Um, during my assignment on the Dixie fire is primarily um, suppression rehab type work, and so we were working with the tribal communities to make sure that we're um, addressing the sites that were of high concern and high priority to them and you know, not causing more damage um, post fire and during the suppression repair phase. So just increasing native voices. The second point I came up with um, sort of the most effective way for us to work on a fire is to educate, I think, the incident command teams on our federal trust responsibility, um, as well as agency administrators and other leadership on the fire and just staff. Um, you know, trust responsibility is um, a pretty, um, uh, big topic and it's all of our duty to make sure that we're not diminishing trust assets or resources um, on incidents and on fires. So just sort of relaying some of those messages about our trust responsibility I thought was also a pretty important point. And then my last point was, um, you know, just being that connection and being that bridge between um, our fire management staff in the whole fire line type stuff and the tribal communities and just really kind of being that that bridge and that connection point um because quite frankly there are two totally separate communities right they have different language they have different jargon they communicate very differently and so really trying to kind of be the glue between those two i thought was also my duty um and being sensitive to to just recognizing that they're both unique and so just sort of tried to walk in those two worlds, which I think we often do. 
um, in many ways in our in our life and our profession. So those are my three points. Increase representation of voices, educate about trust responsibility, and then be that connection. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Yolinda, can we get your views on this? Oh, yes, absolutely. So similarly um, to Sarah, um, I think it's very important. Um, just a couple of things that I want to put out there. One, setting the tone. It's important to acknowledge the lands that we manage as an agency, um, that those lands are the ancestral homelands, the territories of the indigenous people of the area. It's important to do your homework, find out who's who within those um, within the community. Um, and then also understanding that whatever the decisions happen in terms of how we go about in suppression repair and or while we're actively um, fighting fire, that whatever we leave on the landscape, um, the people, the indigenous people will have to live with it. There's no other place for them to go. They're going to have to live on these lands long after we're gone and we go home. So I do think that that's important for folks to understand as they walk into um, an incident all across the, I mean, it's just not specific to the Dixie fire, but, and, or within California, but all across the, the lands that we manage as an agency. The other piece that I think is important important is knowing that as a tribal liaison, you have a lot of latitude in terms of influencing that decision space, that agency administrators, incident commanders, a, um, lead resource advisors have in the kind of decisions um, that they are making. Um, one of the big examples that I have in terms of um, just influencing that decision space is, you know, being very mindful and ensuring that, you know, that the tribes have a seat at the table as folks are wanting to make a decision as to how to move forward within the landscape. Um, in Dixie Fire, there was a place, I think folks remember the spaghetti bowl that went right through an area that was very important to um, the Maidu people and, you know, that the difficulty is that the Maidu people will have to live with that. You know, they're going to continue to revisit these places and, um, you know, I don't know in what context their creation stories will take on those stories, but that landscape and the, the people will have to live with that. I also think this is a huge one for me um, is just setting up um, your team for success. Um, the moment I walked into the, the incident command post in Quincy, California, um, this is on the Dixie Fire, um, Dirk Charlie was the person responsible for setting me up for success. He already had in place some uh, really effective tools. He had a spreadsheet that outlined, outlined key contacts in Indian country. Um, I already had on hand like tribal leaders, tribal members, TIPOs. Um, Trina was on that list, and that was very important for for any person that's going to be in that role. Um, it was also very well documented. There was a daily um, sheet that I could look at and see what Dirk did on certain days and pick up those pieces. And I did not feel like I had to reinvent the wheel whenever I, I showed up. I could pick up uh, Dirk's notes as to how what his inter interaction was like and pick up the pieces wherever he left off. Um, Another piece is that um, whoever you're working with, I we had a tremendous day of just shadowing one another. I think that's important, um, making sure that um, whoever you're bringing on, you know, introducing them to the ICP, making sure they're comfortable. They know who's who, who the lead read is, also the agency administrators. Um, and I, I'll say this many, many times, I think I said it before, but clear communication coordination is very important, especially with the agency administrators and resource advisors, the incident command team. I think that was a very, um, that was a very important to that tribal liaison role. Um, the other tool that I thought was very valuable is that I had a delegation letter from the forest supervisor on the Lassen National Forest, as well as the Plumas National Forest. I knew what my role was. I knew the framework. Um, it does talk about the fiduciary trust responsibility that we have as an agency. And I think for us, the bonus, um, I think Sarah can, as well as Dirk can attest to this, is that we had um, folks from Greenville that were Fireline qualified, available as resources. 
they made my job so easy and they helped us better understand the landscape, the connection to the land that people, um, indigenous people had, and also knew who to contact if we had questions. And I thought that was a very invaluable resource. Had it not been for that, I don't think we would have been as successful um, in some of those relationships that we have. Um, I'll pause there, Tom. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh, let's hear from Trina. Yeah, thank you. Um, my camera is off and I can't turn it back on, but. I, that's fine. We can hear you fine. Trying. So after, especially after um, experiencing the Dixie fire, um, well, initially I was invited by CAL FIRE to engage um, as a cooperator earlier on in the fire. And at that point it hadn't gotten to the lands that we own and we own nearly 3000 acres of properties on six different parcels, each of which was affected by this fire. And um, so I started going to the cooperators meetings and I very quickly realized that I was the only tribal person um, attending meetings at any decision-making level. The the Greenville Rancheria had a fire crew, but the fire crew was um, fighting fire. And then on their days off is, it's it's so emotional. My my son is on that crew, but um, they're, they're, everything they had burned, their fire trucks, fire equipment and everything. And um, so before that, I had I'd called the BIA. I talked to the AAs. I was like, we need more tribal representation here. There's, there's a lot going on, and there's no formal tribal representation. I'm I'm participating simply as a cooperator, and that's not enough. There's decisions being made all day long, um, and we need more representation. And so, um, it I the BIA. I contacted them. Um, they came. Um, I, they started working with the Greenville Rancheria crews. What can we do to support you with recovery? How can we get your people back out on the ground? And in a way, it was almost, um, it, it worked out. It was a horrible thing that happened when they lost their homes. They lost their dental medical clinic facilities, fire equipment, everything. But, and some of the firefighters um, disbanded because they lost their homes. Um, they couldn't put together a crew. But the crew that were able to attend helped so much. They they entered into leadership positions. They interacted. Um, they rallied saying, we need more tribal representation. And then Dirk Charlie calls me up and says, hey, Trina, I've been called about being a tribal liaison on this fire. What do you think? And I'm like, absolutely, Dirk. Oh my gosh, with your expertise and knowledge and experience, um, to to really demonstrate to the tribal um, community or to the fire community how important that role is. Yes, please come. <laughs> and so he, um, arrangements were made and finally he got that call to, of, of being ordered. Um, so I would say, you know, come early. And I'm so happy that there were so many successes on, on the, this fire as horrible as this fire was, that really demonstrated the, the value and the integrity of having tribal liaisons. And how many incident management teams did we have? This was a fire that I was evacuated from my home for two months. And then um, basic services like a grocery store, gasoline and other things took two and a half hours to get one way to. So here's a, a, a community in complete trauma and displacement and having the co continuity of tribal liaisons coming in. This is their role and that that shadowing. Um, it was almost seamless and I have to say I appreciated that so much in the work that each um, person coming in did and it gained my trust that I didn't have to be there every single day. So from July 18th till September 3rd, 23rd, I was there every day but three days. I didn't have a day off. This was my community that was in distress. So come early and let's set up a system that tribal liaisons are just the norm on every fire because we don't know if it's going to be 50 acres or or once it turns into an incident um, type one um, at least or if it's going to turn into almost a million acres. Um, and then the middle 
the middle is the interactions with the IMT and the crews. This um, gave us the opportunity to really help educate people on the ground to um, be escorted out to the spaghetti bowl, which is a place that my family's been in um, since all of our family stories pre-1850. Um, so, so important to us and to be able to talk to the crews on why it was so important that they repair dozer lines with hand tools. <laughs> um, and this mass amount of dozer lines in a super sensitive area. And I think that really impacted being able to have those interactions, but the professionalism of a tribal liaison to guide that and to maintain those conversations and to keep those issues elevated. And then um, leaving as much info information as possible is so important to communities, whether they're tribal or just communities that are affected by wildfires, um, that you know, if, if there's ways to help them know what were the sites that were impacted, um, what is the repair, what's going on with repairs, what can you do to engage and what, what do you have to plan for for the rest of your life to, um, to, for recovery of, of these landscapes. Thank you, Trina. And uh, before we move on, those not familiar with the Dixie Fire, the the Spaghetti Bowl was an area in the east zone of the Dixie that had a very high density of dozer lines, and on the map it looked like a a tangle. So we started calling it the Spaghetti Bowl. So if if you were curious about that reference, uh, Dirk, why don't you go ahead? And I because of my technical problems here, I think you're going to have to uh, uh, show your PowerPoint. Um, yourself, if you don't mind. Well, Tom, I'll just speak to it. Um, okay, you can that's fine that too. PowerPoint for later and share it with the, the participants at a more convenient time. But, you know, when I think about that question about effective way for a tribal liaison to gain, uh, you know, to, to work on a wildfire incident, um, here on the Sierra and Sequoia, we've been through so many fires and we've had this connection since 2013. You know, tribes through our Central Valley uh, Tribal Emergency Management Summits that we've had, we're not strangers, we're partners. And uh, once we hear of a of an incident where it's getting beyond the initial attack phase, I'll just, um, you know, once I start hearing a team being ordered up, um, you know, and I'll be able to kind of determine where it's at, I'll just start to get as much intel as possible before I get there. You know, being a tribal liaison from my own, tribe, I'll try to find out which tribes are being impacted, you know, whose ancestral homelands is the incident on. And I, I just might know some people from that area. And um, if I can, I'll try to contact them and listen to their issues and concerns, get their contacts down and be flexible when I arrive at the incident. But I, I wait for the best time to share these concerns and do timely follow-up. Um, tribal councils are responsible for the safety and welfare of the people. and one of the first things I'll ask is, are they getting the resources they need? So contacts with other uh, cooperators and, and partners like American Red Cross, um, they'll wanna know and uh, we'll be able to make those connections and, and help out. Um, but once I arrived upon an incident, you know, it's a priority for me to introduce myself to the incident commander and um, the incident management team liaisons. The, the team liaisons are like my some of my best friends you know, with any kind of incident, because they got the connections, you know, they'll introduce me to their sheriffs, uh, PG&E, uh, other cooperators, other teams. And um, that Dixie fire was um, was unique in that it was so scattered. And we were in the middle of chaos. It, it was traumatic. And one thing that I, it's one of the more interesting fires I've ever had in, in, in my extensive experience. But, you know, I, I always felt like, well, Got to be even with the uh, the information. So, uh, the public information officers, uh, those are very valuable people, and I, I go seek them. And I'll then the lead reads absolutely. You know, I'll I'll go there and find out where everybody's at, get their best contact information, and retain that to make that for the project record. Um, and it is true, uh, some of the agency administrators, incident management team members, they never heard of what a tribal liaison was about. So I'll already have a pre-made packet for them with my position description in it and uh, helpful 
documents, you know, um, some of the things I asked for was like, so you guys are aware of inadvertent discovery, right? You know, you guys have a plan just in case. And some people looked at me and they felt, they just looked at me and was like, inadvertent discovery, huh? So I just seized the moment and, and tried to educate them. But I'm, I'm always gonna work with the locals. So uh, once I get that down, uh, you know, then I'll, I'll be able to share what the locals have on hand or just, you know, be able to bring in my technical expertise and knowledge on some of this area. But, uh, you know, what's what's important as a liaison is the, the briefings, the timing, you know, especially the cooperators meetings, you know, because that's where you got to make sure that the tribes have an opportunity to participate, you know, a voice at the table. And, and we had such a unique situation going on in Dixie with... Uh, lack of infrastructure as far as like connectivity. I mean, it was terrible, you know? So a lot of the stuff I was thinking, you know what? I'm gonna have to give them as much fire information packets and maps and, and be ready to share and deliver to them, okay? So I'm always looking for an opportunity to, to get oriented, you know, where am I? You know, fire perimeter access routes. Uh, I need to know who's who, where they're at in ICP and then the community's impacted. But where are the tribal offices located? Because I'm I'm there to serve them. I'm the liaison and everything. I got the best of the best information I have at that time, and I want to meet and I want to greet them. But but with COVID, the last couple of years have been crazy. So you know, again, I got to observe tribal protocol. But uh, I'm a 24/7 guy. And, you know, you can contact me anytime. But I do try my best to research and identify who that local tribal relations uh, program managers or their tribal liaisons are. That could be federal, state tribal liaisons, you know, like like with pg e or like with CAL FIRE or something. But uh, if I can gain access to their contact list and, uh, you know, that saves me from having to reinvent the wheel or a, a cold call, but I'll listen to the locals and share their information because um, they're there, they work there and they might already have these already established relationships or maybe relationships that were less than, okay? Remember, I'm not from there at Dixie Fire. So I come there and I introduced myself and I did my best to, um, you know, to, to prove my worth and do it in a good way. But I'll always look for the earliest opportunity to join the reads and introduce myself and explain my role and responsibility. Again, some reads have never worked with tribal liaisons, some did. And, uh, but I'll, I'll try to gain a timely update and listen to the lead reads direction and plan accordingly. And I'll share what tribal information that I know, identify the you know the tribe's areas of importance, and listen to their priorities as far as uh, what what the tribes have to say because I, I need to know. And um, I'm a line scout, you know. I I want to go out there eventually. I need to see. I need to know. And uh, and again, make friends all the way. Thank you. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, to follow up on your comments. Um, Drilling down a little more, what specifically is the role of the tribal liaison with the agency administrator and the resource advisors, and how does that relationship work? And let's start with uh, Yolinda for this one. Um, you know, well, we're, you're in the midst of an incident. Each incident, I feel like, has its own energy and chaos associated with it, um, but. I feel like agency administrators, um, there are so many emerging issues and concerns that they're dealing with while they're there on an incident that I feel as though that they don't have, may not have the time and opportunity to really um, hear the indigenous, the, the tribal folks out and hear their, listen to their issues and concerns. And I think that's a big role of the tribal liaison is to ensure that the AAs, the incident commanders, um, those that are helping out the lead reads understand what those issues and concerns are. Um, I do think that, you know, a huge part, um, and Dirk kind of pointed to, alluded to this, is, is really trying to build that relationship um, and really trying to ensure that those voices are brought to the table and that while decisions are being made, that those perspectives are being shared a, a little in a way that is respectful and also responsive to what we're hearing from the tribes. Um, 
You know, I also think that, you know, for resource advisors, the teams, we also had a wonderful opportunity on the Dixie Fire um, to also, um, there was a, another tribal um, fire, wildland fire organization that came over from Chumash and they were awesome. They understood, they knew this connection to the landscape. And so that really helped out as well whenever we can find opportunities like that. And I found that, you know, in that environment that we were working within, um, you know, the tribal liaison would, uh, it's, I found them leaning on Chumash to help out with some of those sensitive um, places and opportunities where they wanted the land to be treated with care and more attention, like using the hand tools. And I thought that's a that's a pretty important role for the tribal liaison to ensure that we're also identifying resources and making sure that those resources are connecting to those um, tribal perspectives and making sure that in that opportunity and time and space that where they can, they can help out in that in a big way. Um, I also feel as though that, you know, there is one more piece to this. Um, is that you know there is within the Forest Service um, there we do have a fiduciary trust responsibility that we have to uphold and I think it's important to share that with the tribes in a way that is very respectful. Um, you know I do think that that's an important part of that role. Um, it's it's outlined in at least in the letter that I received as um, my role as a tribal liaison, and so I think that's important for us to acknowledge that um, as we work with tribes and let them know what our role is as we begin leveraging those relationships. Thank you, Linda. Um, Trina, do you want to offer your perspectives on the agency administrator, tribal liaison, resource advisor interaction? Yeah. Um, this is probably one of the most important relationships on fire. Um, and that ability, um, previous to having, like during the North Complex fires last year that killed 16 people in our homelands as well, we didn't have a tribal liaison and it was absolute chaos. And and again, as Yolanda pointed out, um, the AAs have so much on their plate and so does a resource advisor on a large fire. There's so much happening so quickly and the fire changes, it can change dramatically in a few hours um, that having that, that role um, more defined and like Dirk having, hey, here's my job description. This is, you know, this is because most AAs don't know what to do. They look at a tribal liaison and they don't know what to do with them. So um, sometimes they kind of ignore them. They create distance. <laughs> um, and continue, can, continuing to show up is important. And and then also with the resource advisors and the lead read, building those relationships, um, what are the most important um, cultural sites, what are the important cultural sites, who are the people that need to be contacted if those areas are impacted. These are so important and um, one of the things that happened to, for me on the Dixie fire in particular, um, just because that's the most recent fire in my memory, um, is that as I said, I showed up every single day and I quickly realized that I was the only person showing up and there were cultural site after cultural site, some of our most sacred places being impacted and um, just outlining, you know, on a handwritten map that, hey, these are really important places. And so then the feedback I was getting was, well, can't you just give us a map? And I'm like, no, I don't have a map worked with the forest for 20 years building these maps making sure that they had these places mapped why you know where is that map that the forest has that we helped them build build for 20 years or more um and so there were finding those missing links that are just absolutely important that can make everybody's jobs easier and educating and um building that sense of teamwork with with between the lead read, the tribal liaison, the AAs is so, so important. Um, also, the, I, the one question that I had um, and is so, sometimes as a tribal liaison, you're asked to work with um, 
for a staff that aren't assigned to the fire. And so you may be asked to do things that aren't really, that create a whole different tract that may create its own difficulty because you're talking to somebody who's working eight to five, they have other meetings or things like that. And so the AAs um, trying to, that relationship is just really important. Thanks, uh, Trina. I see uh, questions coming into the chat. Let's hold those to the end. I'll make sure we have time for questions. Uh, continuing this discussion on the agency administrator and the reads, um, Dirk, do you want to give us your perspectives on that? You know what? Uh, when I think about agency administrators, and I went through a lot of them <laughs> on that Dixie, but same way when I went on the KNP fire, <laughs> who are they? Where are they from? I'll ask them, you know, um, do you know what a trauma liaison does? And if they didn't, I just, again, I gave them a packet of information, but I, I would, uh, uh, but that that connection with the incident commander is everything. I'll ask them the top three things, and I'll tell them of the number of tribes that you're uh, that we're dealing with, and I'm in communications with. Uh, having that packet of information is so important because that'll help them when they set the tone and emphasize the incident priorities and objectives. Um, I'll follow management's uh, intent, and I'll do my best to ensure they respect tribal sovereignty. And read teams are supported and respected to the best of their ability. And that's where, uh, Tom, this type of uh, a briefing is extremely important is that you got a guy in your corner, you know, I'm, I'm in a unique position. And, uh, you know, and the people that I'm working with, I, I've been doing this since 1979. I'm not a stranger. So the people I started out with back in the 70s, uh, they're the bosses now. So I'm not uh, looked at as just some newcomer. When I walk in, those are friends of mine. Those are people I've had influence with, and uh, they they know that. And they'll usually seek me out and say, "Hey, I've got some work for you," and and that's a good thing for me, because uh, I'll be telling them at that same time. There's that the right time to make the connection to express an issue and concern from a tribal leader, or tribal leaders and groups and organizations, spiritual leaders, uh, interested parties. But I think that. Uh, when you, I get a chance to get them in front uh, an agency administrator or incident management team, if I get them in front of an executive briefing for a tribal uh, council, uh, that, that is extremely important. And I'll try to do it. Uh, the tribes like to hear group briefings. So we did that here on the Sequoia complex where I had nine tribes on the Eastern Sierra Nevada and, uh, and here on the uh, Sequoia side, you know, uh, we did that with five other tribes. And that's something that we, we feel very important about. I feel very important about is that when, when the HC administrators are there meeting them and seeing them and uh, bringing maps, bringing big agency maps, you know, tribes have their own maps. They have their own archaeologists, they have their cultural resources directors and everything. These people have political moxie. They're going to make sure their voice is heard. But how we do it in a timely manner matters a lot. During the incident, you know, I'll, I'll help them also with not just the key thing is stop the fire, okay, contain the fire. But but the other part of it is that you got to stop and think about, um, you know, uh, what's going to happen after the fire, the, the recovery aspects that are the components. So, you know, we'll, we'll want to be able to help the uh, agency administrators that are on the incident, uh, help the agency administrators that are going to be inheriting all of this ton of work and uh, probably still ongoing work. And uh, that, that's always been a very important point about site visits. So as soon as we can get site visits out there with the tribes, with the agency administrators included, and uh, you know the designated specialists and everything, we'll do that as quickly as possible because those are recovery components. The tribes will have, a, will have they will wanna have a say in those. So, but if you can get an agency administrator, uh, administrators, to help contribute their senior advice and counsel, uh, to help access uh, resources or, or tap into uh, processes that help tribe restore lands impacted by the fire, all the better, okay? And again, I heard some great ideas, you know, that would help out on the Humbug Valley area, for example, in the Dixie, or up in the, on the KMP complex here on the Sequoia Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Forest. But 
yes. having those agency administrators available to communicate with tribal leadership officials, decision makers to decision makers, fiduciary decision making, you know, that, that is just all the, all the greatest uh, 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 benefit we can get out of it. And also to have the tribal uh, staff members and tribal leadership get to know these administrators, okay? Um, um, you know, it's, it's something that if you could do it face-to-face, -face, great. Uh, if not, you're gonna have to rely upon virtual or teleconference, it, it doesn't matter. Providing the opportunity to participate matters a lot because this will uh, be able to be balanced in that both parties are hearing and are communicating with the best of the best information, but they'll be able to make uh, timely mitigation measures happen, you know, whether during that time of the incident or as time goes on. And that's something that, um, the other thing about the agency administrators is that you gotta do timely follow-up. I mean, we haven't done follow-up on the rough fire 2015 and all those other fires because of, it was just pretty, pretty heavy uh, fire incidents that's happened on the, the central Sierra Nevada. But you know what, when you don't go do any follow-up, then what are we talking about? You know, I mean, why are we, here we go again, you know, haven't you guys got a plan for that? Didn't we give you input on that? And that, that can be very damaging uh, when you don't do any of the follow-up. Again, I'm, I'm working on some of that stuff right now. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah, um, <laughs> your perspectives on the role of tribal liaison with the agency administrator and the resource advisors. Yeah, and I'll try to keep it brief because I see we only have 15 minutes left, but I am um, really the agency administrator providing that delegation of authority, I think was pretty critical in providing that sort of large scale logistics and coordination. Um, you know, I'll also mention that our agency administrators could really be that champion if we felt like tribal voices weren't being heard, like they could kind of escalate it to that, that next level um, and be there. But um, you know, the, the other last point I'll make on agency administrators is I sort of saw them too as um, assisting with the rotations that would happen with assignments. So they kind of served as those bookends to just make sure that uh, those transitions went smoothly. So just brief comments there, because I know this last question is, is fun to talk about too. <laughs> okay, and our, our last question is, how can the tribal liaison um, foster a focus on archaeology and heritage resources and seeing they're properly uh, addressed. And um, let's start with Dirk on that one. I enjoy this, okay? Again, it's my job is to welcome you, introduce myself. Are you from here? Do you know these people? Have you ever done this type of work? But I, I like to make timely introductions to Indian country. These become long lasting relationships and increased knowledge of working with tribal cultures and you know the lands, the water, the cultural resources, uh, use practices and techniques. The uh, tribal liaisons can serve as good interpreters for understanding fire suppression terminology and, and communications. You know, So when I'm listening to the reads and I'm gathering their intel, I'm able to, to, to be able to bounce back about, this is what's important to the tribes. Timing matters a lot. Um, Tribal liaisons help identify tribe status, federal, non-federally recognized. It, you know, fortunately, most incident management teams and agency administrators, they respect tribal sovereignty and they seek a smooth and effective working relationship. Remember, this is the fire, it's happening, you know, uh, stay focused and everything, but just know your who they are and, and who we're working with. Um, this is where um, I, I try to talk to them about an inadvertent discovery plan if it's NADPA, inadvertent discovery, all tribes are gonna be wanting to know. Okay, now how you work together and communicate and everything, I'll leave that to the heritage resources staff, but people are still gonna to wanna to know, Tom, you're gonna to wanna to be able to uh, uh, communicate in a good way, because that is our ancestors, what's more sacred than a, a burial ground and everything. When I think about those areas though, um, sacred areas, there's things that are near and dear to their heart and I'll do everything I can to work with the reeds and, and help them best understand how we're gonna do it. Um, when I think about tribal liaison, some people ask about, hey, are they fire line qualified? Uh, maybe some are, but most aren't, but they have a good fire experience. They receive the required training and uh, safety training, and they regularly perform their duties with a heads up safety attitude at all times and come prepared 
when headed out to the field. So your tribal liaisons, are, they're not pencil neck geeks and everything. They're people that are out there working together and they have connections, you know. They're escorted by Fireline qualified personnel, Chumash crew, the, the Yurok folks that are out there, the folks from uh, uh, the Blackfeet and everything. And I've worked with some good Indian crews and those guys, those, those crews, they're, they're very good. They're very effective. They're culturally sensitive. They're being in a skill set that are, are unique. Um, but, you know, again, I go out there and I'm not a rookie myself, you know, uh, it's a good combination to go together as an escort to me. I have no problem with that. Safety first. But by establishing those friendly working relationships, you, it, it will lead to development of smart planning, making connections to already established initiatives and projects. Remember, the fire might have burned in there. OK, but those types of resources, Tom, they're already established. Well, well, let's make more efficient use of their time, you know. So tribal liaisons can, can work with the tribes. Make sure you listen to their request to work together and make repairs. If a site was damaged or a sacred site violated or damaged, again, um, some tribal, some resource advisors have never worked with tribes before. My job is to educate them and, uh, and I'll do my best, but Reeds, you can be more flexible in your duties and assigned task if you're, we're utilizing the local tribal resources or fire crews the cultural resource uh, departments, uh, any uh, local landowners and everything. But, uh, you know, their, their traditional ecological knowledge and cultural monitoring expertise, if they can make it available, then we will. But, but remember, we're, our job is to help them help us. And, uh, you know, if you can, uh, I know I was tasked to, and to order up uh, the various uh, specialty crews like the Chumash crew. So I do that paperwork. I'm kind of like the administrative guy in the background. It doesn't matter, make it happen, help that read, help the read team. But of all, of all you know, I, the read teams, you're my best friends, so I gotta work with you guys in a good way. And uh, I'll do everything I can to make that happen. Thanks. Thanks, Dirk. Um, Trina, you've touched on this already, but let's give you some more opportunity to talk about archeology span and heritage resources, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, these, these are, some of the most important reasons besides our lives that we are concerned about areas within our homelands. And these are places that were here long before us and hopefully they will be here long after us. And so again, it comes down to communications and um, not being assigned to a fire and um, coming in and trying to communicate and during cooperators meetings and for the most part that was done really well but not being there consistently throughout the day as decisions were being made i know i spoke to that once already but um i really want to stress how important that is and that the role of the tribal liaison to carry not just my knowledge but to reach out to every tribal community possible and i know you guys are running on the dixie fire and um other fires as well to be able to do that there's a lot of tribal people and communities that are affected in these fires and to be able to represent that and maintain that um to the imts to the aas to the reeds but also the crews on the ground and um and then also really assessing what what's missing here. How can we order what's missing? You know, like bringing in the Shumash crews, they had tremendous expertise and experience. And I think they themselves really inspired some of the crews that they worked with um, and, and helped educate as well. And so bringing, you know, your role of really assessing what's needed, what can we do, what are, what can we bring in that's not represented, um, and then the informative, informative education during the briefing, the morning briefing, the evening briefing, um, in the IAPs, you know, just having pieces like what is sacred or something so that they learn something that's brief, but it's something that they think about every day. Thank you. Um, Sarah, let's have your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks. Um, really how the tribal liaisons can work with reads identified about six or so points. Um, reads can really help us identify those areas that are needed for priority or special concern that have either sensitive areas. You guys are kind of the, the boots on the ground, I, I felt to some degree. And so just flagging that for our attention, if it wasn't already on our radar, I think was really important. 
Also, um, having the reads help coordinate and assist when we bring these tribal monitors or tribal crews on board to identify these projects. So in our little trailer, we had sort of a running tab and a running list of projects for the, the tribal crews to work on. And a lot of that came from the input from the reads. So that I think is just really helpful. Um, the other thing that I think reads can help out with is identifying these areas that are for that are suitable for field tours when it's requested or um, you know offered by us for tribal leadership. So um, again, you all just being sort of the boots on the ground and knowing these places, areas that we can bring tribal leadership out to to kind of get their input, I think is really critical. Um, the other thing that I think reads can provide to us is input for executive briefings for tribal leadership. So I, I did get the opportunity to go present with Tr with Trina and with the Maidu Summit. Um, and so any information that reads can provide to us as sort of handouts and materials uh, to get back to the tribal community was key. Um, last two points, just helping us connect to those intertribal groups if it's not already there. So one thing I saw the reads um, experience is some of those roads would um, open up access and so uh, folks would be driving through or starting to re-enter the fire area and tribal members would just reach out to whoever's there on site and sometimes it was the the read in that area um, bringing up their concerns too and so just making those points and those connections I think uh, is key and then lastly just um, one thing I noticed, you know, a way for us to work together is, um, and I think several of us have mentioned providing maps to tribal communities. Um, so we provided large fire severity maps to all the tribes that were impacted. Um, and then also sort of more of those fine grain maps where um, we had some detail on kind of what was being done in these sites. And I know those are resources that that reads produce and sort of maintain and utilizing those and giving those back to the community, I, I thought um, was something that the tribes really appreciated. Thanks. Well, I want to allow time for questions, but let's uh, give Yolinda some time to address um, this issue of archaeology and heritage resources first. Go ahead, Yolinda. My response is pretty simple, and that is ensuring that tribes have a seat at the table in the decision making process. I think that's huge um, in terms of providing that space and opportunity um, for that discussion to happen. Um, there is one thing that I think is pretty important that we may not always think about as um, as resource advisors, as we're helping out with an incident, but oftentimes when we're in this um, kind of like an emergent situation in responding to an incident, we don't realize that some of the information that is being shared is highly sensitive to a tribe. It's important to keep that in the back of your mind as you're working with a tribe that it's probably not for knowledge for you to share, but rather for you to take into consideration in the work that we do. Um, and I say that with because oftentimes, you know, things are moving fast, people are jotting down notes, sharing information about possibly sacred sites where ancestors are located at. And um, it's not shareable. I think you should, given that environment, you know, you should be to ask the question to the tribes like, is this, can I share this or is this for my information only, for my knowledge only? And um, I think it's something that, you know, we don't really often think about, but it did. It is something that did come up within the Dixie fire that we were on that, you know, we had locations, we had sites that we knew about and it, they're highly sensitive and we have to treat that within that regard as well. Thank you. Um, so we have a few minutes here. Let's move on to questions uh, and anyone on the panel can answer. First question is, how is the participation of tribal representatives funded during an incident? Anyone want to tackle Dirk, that? I think Dirk has a, he, I follow, I follow Dirk's path as, um, and Dirk, I think you can, I, th I would give it, give the floor to you and how you were able to make that happen. Um, Again, you know, I'm a call when needed tribal liaison, so I work for the feds. But when I think about uh, working with the, the tribes, 
this is something that I, I'm trying my best to influence them about, you know, whether or not I can train a, an upcoming group of young tribal liaisons, you know, it doesn't matter whether young or old, but somebody has to make an impact and they're usually going to be, uh, you know, there'll be tribal staff members, but, you know, if you can get them on board from recruiting from the federal workforce or, or state, that, that's a good thing, you know. I think that is something that I feel should be happening right now in preparation wise. Hope that helped. Next question. Is there any movement in the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management to build tribal participation into the supervisor's office or the district office so we are better prepared for incidents when they happen? Any thoughts on that? I, um, so no, like my participation this year was just because my board said you need to do this. And so we funded my participation and, um, and to that, the last national forest after this fire is going to, um, we're working to get me on AD status as a sponsoring agency. And that's, one step forward and they're trying to um, do the same with other tribal represent representatives that have that are red card qualified and have um, resource advisor qualifications. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, another question, what is your vision for pre fire planning to better protect tribal interests? Maybe I'll mention something here on, on that question. Um, I think one of my visions is to have um, MOUs or other participating agreements between the local forests or districts and the tribes that have ties to those areas. So this is more like a the, the structural approach to having those conversations uh, proactively in the off season. <laughs> not, now that we have a fire year, though, there's not really an off season <laughs> anymore, but just having mm -hmm. that sort of um document an agreement in place that allows us to set those um dialogues and conversations and maintain that relationship through time and i think that really helps with the pre-planning so you know one thing i'll mention up in montana um with the fire lab and you know the development of pods the flathead is really trying to have a um a say in where some of those pods are located and, and that's all being done you know pre-fire season so just maintaining those relationships through time and um, using those MOUs as a mechanism. Um, and I'll add um, one more thought to what Sarah is talking about. I'm gonna take off my tribal liaison hat, put on the district ranger hat is, I really do think that we need to, um, you know, what's unique and probably most folks on this call may be struggling with this, but. Um, Region 5 is fairly unique in that they did order up the tribal liaisons. You're not going to see that on every incident, um, and that's uh, an interesting scenario to be in. Um, but what I will say is that what I did learn from the Dixie Fire is that um, working alongside with BIA in the pre-planning process in trying to get those tribal members red card and also fire line qualified is huge. Um, that is such a big piece to that. There are so many people that came in with the willingness to help, but were not red, red card qualified to go out on the fire line to help out with the work on the ground. That was very disheartening to turn people away that wanted to help. Um, but a lot of that, um, they did tell us that it was dependent on the ability to work with BIA and get their red cards through that whole process. Um, you know, if we did have better pre-planning, that is something that I would advocate for is to see if we can work alongside our other federal partners to, um, you know, try to support Indian country the best way we can. And that's one way we could do that. So um, in the chat, um, Monty uh, would like to address the question of how tribal um, liaisons are paid for. So Monty, do you want to jump in here? Sure. You got me uh, on my audio. I can hear you fine. OK, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to actually answer this earlier in relation to some other questions. The tribal liaison position is not officially 
like a an IW uh, NWCG position. It's uh, a lot of folks use the liaison position to get ordered, but often, you know, that that's a, a high level CNG um, qualification, and not everybody who would be a good tribal liaison would necessarily have that qualification. So you might have to get creative. I know the tech spec thing is is highly abused. The, the cultural specialist can be abused, but those might be calls that you have to encourage. Um, and I, I know we're speaking to reads right now. I'm a read too. So um, as a resource advisor, if you go to an incident and you see a need for a tribal liaison, it might be up to you or your lead read to talk to the IC and encourage the ordering of someone in that position. Um, and that's who would pay for the position is either the team, which you know eventually it would be nice if we get a tribal liaison CNG level official position in IMTs. However, until that happens, that's a, that's a whole other argument. Until that happens, it might be your role to talk to your AA. Your agency administrator can order a tribal liaison position, and that's what we ended up doing on the Dixie. And and I know um, uh, Trina, I can't cannot be said enough how much she did in the beginning. None of this, everything that grew uh, in terms of representation came out of her going every day unpaid. Um, just showing up, seeing a need, calling a read, Stephen Hodges, and and Stephen Hodges reached out to me at the BIA, and we showed up, and then oh, talked to your AAs. Um, I know Yolinda was saying that Region 5, uh, this was something special that they ordered AAs. It was actually that district ranger for the Plumas. Um, he was super supportive. Immediately, he ordered two uh, two tribal liaisons at our request because of Trina's suggestion. Um, I, I don't want to get too far into it. I hope that answers many questions, um, but I, I, I tried to tie that back to what you can do as a read in terms of ordering is, yeah, we can't pay for it, but you can ask the forest or, or the agency to or the team to pay for it. Thanks. Thanks, Monty. Um, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank all our panelists uh, today for an excellent uh, session. Thank you for your time and all your contributions. And I've also worked with all of you on the Dixie Fire. So thank you for your contributions there too. Uh, you really contributed to uh, success there. I'll, I'll just com uh, close with this comment in the chat. Um, as an enrollment tribal member of Tule River Tribe and an employee of the Chumash. It is awesome to hear these conversations at the table. Appreciate all your concerns and time. This is something long overdue, but better late than never. The more we can shine light on these situations, the better we can move into a better position for all parties involved. So I think that's a good way to end this. Thanks again everyone and we'll see you uh next month on the the recall thanks thanks thank you thank you yeah, thank you toma